join the future ones. So yeah, thank you for inviting us. Um, and I look forward to it. And right from the start, the state of the, the title of the talk is a state and future of e-commerce payments in South Africa. It's quite a pretentious title maybe, and I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm not the authority on this. I'm just gonna give you our experience and our findings and what we think is important. And, you know, as I said, I've been watching Joel's talks and Joel gave a fantastic talk in June about the state of e-commerce in South Africa. And I just refer people, if you want more information, go watch that talk, because that was pretty awesome. Um, cool. So quick background. Um, I'm a tech lead in the e-commerce team at Yoko. And what that means is we build and maintain the gateway plugins. I was saying earlier to Grace that we obviously have the WooCommerce plugin, we have a Wix plugin, uh, working on a Zoho plugin and fingers crossed, maybe Shopify sometime soon. Um, and we also support developers using our web SDK. Now our web SDK is used for low level integrations with custom built websites. And the web SDK actually powers the plugins that we, uh, that we write. Um, the large online payments team has payment foundations um, and solutions like our payment page, our payment links and vouchers. Um, and we try to cater for merchants across the spectrum of online payments, right from when they start all the way through to when they're doing sophisticated integrations, uh, low level integrations. Um, so Yoko, as many people probably know, we do in-person payments, but we also do online payments. And our sort of reason for being is to help small pay businesses get paid, right? And for them to grow. So we, we fully behind small business in South Africa. Uh, not many people know that we offer an integrated ecosystem, including online and offline, and also business software and uh, merchant cash advantage, advances, which is capital for, for running your business. So it's not just little blue card machines. There's more to us than just that. Um, and a big part of who we are is about establishing open commerce. Um, that's a core part of our business. Open, open commerce means allowing businesses to take payments, uh, breaking down barriers, but it also more and more means enabling developers and other parties to use our systems so they can build their own businesses. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we launched online payment solutions in March uh, last year. We planned to launch a little bit later, but we had to accelerate when COVID happened. And these two graphs kind of show the impact of, of COVID on, on our business. Um, the first one, you can see that just basically falling off a cliff around about March. Uh, it was down to about only like 10% uh, of the normal um, revenue. And then you can see in the background, you'll see this gray climbing wall here. That was the first wave. You can see there was a, a steady increase uh, and recovery into May. And on the one right hand side, you can see the big hump of the first wave and the steady recovery of our merchants. Um, obviously, Food, drink, and hospitality was most heavily affected, um, at, but retail was quite resilient and came back strong. I think many, many merchants switched online during that period. I think Joel, in his talk, had some good figures about the impact of COVID. Um, and you can see on this graph, the first wave, the second wave, now we hit the third wave. The one thing that we see is that merchants are recovering quickly and they're very resilient, um, thankfully. Okay, so that's the background. Uh, a quick agenda for the talk. I'm going to give um, a quick overview of the e-commerce landscape. Um, then I'm going to talk about how online payments work. That's probably what I can speak about with the most authority. Is it some of the technical aspects? Not too technical, but I'll give you some insight. I want to tell you what we think uh, payment gateways should aim for. Not necessarily what we offer now, but what we should aim for. What's the ideal? What you as developers and businesses and merchants can do when you select a payment gateway and you get going. And at the end, I'll take some questions and I want to give you some prizes. Um, and yes. just up front, <laughs> just up front, we've got um, some swag boxes. I don't know if Zoom's going to show them, but swag boxes full of clothes and caps and hoodies. And also we're going to offer a voucher to take a lot. I'll be asking some, some questions about one or two things in the talk. And the first one to get it, get the prizes. I think we give two prizes, right, Prince? The first prize and the second prize. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, so let's kick off. Um, so what about the landscape? 
So here are the payment gateways. Uh, there are more, but these are the main ones we're all aware of. Um, most of them have pay in their name except Yoko. So that's interesting. <laughs> uh, but huge credit to all of these, the established players and the newer players, you know, they've done an amazing job establishing online payments in South Africa. I think many of these companies are doing really great things. Um, great to see Paystack in the market as well, innovating. Um, and I think we're only going to make it stronger altogether. So very excited to be part of the space. Um, yeah, and so those are the payment gateways, but how many ways can a consumer choose to pay? And it's actually quite, quite intimidating when you go to check out this on the right hand side, this is a checkout for take a lot. And you can see some of them are grayed out, but there are a lot of options. So you've got credit and debit card, instant EFT, EFT, cash on delivery, Snap scan, Moss Pass, which are both QR, Buy Now, Pay Later, which is um, a big one, um, Apple, Google, and Samsung Pay, which not a huge impact yet, but they're growing. And then obviously the loyalty and coupons. Um, lots of ways of, of taking payment, which is great, but it's, uh, yeah, a, a lot there. So one thing to, to realize, uh, this is one bit of research I found. There's other research which uh, corroborates these numbers. But the one thing to realize is card, debit card and credit card are still dominating. So in this graph, you can see the debit card is 24% and credit card is 19. So 24 plus 19, 43% of e-commerce payments in South Africa are still card. Um, and then behind that is things like mobile wallets uh, or EFT um, and so on. So card is still quite dominant. Um, there are some trends though that, that we should watch. Um, first one is that the challenger banks like Time Bank, Bank Zero, Discovery Bank and so on, they're really making, it, making cards more available for e-commerce usage. So we actually expect that to increase going forward. Um, and then more and more people will have the cards to use online. Buy now, pay later is a really big trend, and that seems to be gaining a lot of traction. Uh, there are quite a few players in that space, and it's really something to watch. Instant EFT, um, also big. And as I said, the mobile wallets, they are there and they will grow, but uh, they're still quite a minor player. Um, as for the payment device, this is interesting because 60% of e-commerce sales seems to seem to be on mobile devices. However, there's actually a higher transaction volume on the desktop. So the, the purchases on desktop seem to be bigger uh, for a higher value, um, but more, more a number of sales higher on mobile. So the takeaway is you can't neglect either channel, but you really need to know who your customers are. What is the, um, the profile of the customers visiting your site? Are they using mobile? Are they using desktop? Yeah, you should certainly cater for both, but it's good to that, have that information. Um, another interesting thing to look at is that, uh, yeah, in-person point of sale revenue is still far outweighing e-commerce revenue. Um, 2020, 180 um, compared to, to only five for the whole of e-commerce. So we've got a lot of space to grow in other markets. You know, that's much higher. I think it's been mentioned that the UK is around 20%. Um, so a lot of potential there. And then another thing to be aware of is that uh, e-commerce is not just um, websites. I mean, social selling is a massive part of that, particularly for smaller merchants. Um, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, um, payment and product links. And we think that's really going to continue to grow. It's still a very important part, not only by itself, but also used in conjunction. Um, and there are other options to setting up your own site on Shopify or Woo. Um, we have offerings from Standard Bank and the DPO store, uh, Shopstar, trying to get merchants online very quickly through hosted solutions. Um, the trade-off there is, is lim limited flexibility, but there really is a continuum or a spectrum of offering. And as merchants grow in their sophistication, they can choose various things. So, so that's the landscape. Um, I just want to dive a little bit into how online payments work, uh, what, what happens behind the scenes. Um, now, 
the bad news is it's, it's quite complicated if you really want to understand what's going on. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to simplify things a little bit just to take you through a common sort of path for, for payments. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to run you through a scenario uh, very briefly. Uh, as we all know, it starts with a customer visiting the merchant's website uh, or using their app. Um, and they try to check out. And, and when they do that, um, they enter their card details. Now, when that happens, um, uh, an initiation is made for 3D Secure. Now, 3D Secure in this country is essential. Um, it's mandatory in many cases. And uh, what happens there is that um, the request goes to the payment gateway, which then forwards that onto the interoperability layer, which determines who this person is banking with. Um, and they do that through a 3D Secure plugin. And they check if the card and the bank are enrolled for 3D Secure. Um, and if they are, which bank is offering, which bank are they with? Who has issued that card? Um, once they know that, a request is made to an access control server, which determines what is the, the page, what mechanism should be used by the bank to authenticate the user. That's passed all the way back to the, to the user as a 3D secure pop-up or an iframe or a redirect, um, or in some cases, it goes directly to the user's banking app. Um, once they successfully authorize, uh, it's confirmed to the payment gateway, which then gets the results of the 3D secure, not from, from the app or the website, but again, through the network. And only then, after that 3D secure process can be done, uh, does the actual charge happen through the acquiring bank? Now, this is the merchant's bank. Um, and then through the card network, and then finally to the issuing bank. This is the customer's bank who holds the funds, and they will release the funds and uh, firstly confirm that the funds are available and then start the process of releasing the funds to the acquiring bank. So, there are lots of parties in this. Uh, in my next slide, I'm actually going to show you all of the parties involved in this. Um, and it's, there's quite a lot of friction to doing payments. You know, you've got to go through a lot of steps. You've got to wait a while for this process to take place. The good news is some of this is going to be simplified when 3D Secure 2 is implemented. And in that case, under certain circumstances, you won't have to do the manual 3D Secure process of doing the OTP um, or verifying in your banking app and the reason it can do that is because it's going to build up a risk uh, assessment for that transaction um, and that's based on a fingerprint of your browser uh, do you seem to be the same person and is the tr transaction value high or low and based on that risk assessment you may just skip the manual 3d secure step which reduces friction which means payments take less time and more payments are going to be successful um, so that, that's an overview of how online payments work. Um, this slide just really, I don't want to spend much time on it, but it shows you all the players uh, in the process. So if we imagine Joe Smith has a NetBank Visa credit card, he visits Acme, and Acme Incorporator's website, um, who then use an e-commerce platform. We'll say in this case, WordPress and WooCommerce. Uh, they've integrated the payment gateway. Let's say Yoko. Yoko collects the card details securely, uh, so that we may use a secure uh, card collection and proxying service, and then that gets passed on to some payment process or a switch, which passes it on to the interrupt, which is the, the fabric that makes all of this communication prop, uh, work properly. Um, the card network, in this case it's Visa, because it's a Visa credit card, is there, and then we talk to the issuing bank, the bank that gave the customer the credit card, in this case, NetBank, and there's communication with Standard Bank, which is the acquiring bank in this fictitious scenario. So all of these players are involved um, behind your payment. It's not really linear like this. It doesn't happen in this chain in practice, but, but that's, that's the process. Um, so where do things go wrong? I mean, it's very important to know how things can go wrong when you try to accept a payment. Because if you know how it can go wrong, you can try to reduce the number of failures. And if you reduce the number of failures, you increase the number of sales that you make successfully. Um, one of the, the 
places it can happen is directly on the merchant site. So if there are any sort of networking issues from your hosting provider, um, we've seen this in practice before where the, the, the network issues between the host and our payment gateway. We've seen hosting issues where a host has put a firewall in place accidentally and that stopped communication. Sometimes merchants don't configure HTTPS for their site and that's a non-starter. You have to have that for, in order for this to work. And then the, our plugin and other plugins do various checks for, are you using South African RANDs for your currency? If you're not, uh, you cannot tr transact. Other, other checks like security checks. Um, so if you've set up your site, or haven't configured it correctly, that could be the first part where payments don't get off the ground. Uh, there can be user error in capturing the card details, entering incorrect CVV, not much we can do about that. Some cards just aren't supported for e-commerce. And that is something that payment gateways can try to improve, adding support for as many cards and schemes as possible. 3D secure could fail. Uh, we have seen times where um, the payment processes are down for some periods. Uh, the card network, like the Visa network, we've experienced has been down for a small amount of time. As hard as it is to believe, it has actually happened. Um, the customer's bank in some cases can be down for 3D secure. And this is like a transient thing. Our, um, our, our consumers, or the, the consumers using a merchant site complain that 3D secure didn't work. We investigated, turns out there was some downtime at the bank. And, and lastly, 3D secure can just not be enabled for a particular card. And in that case, the customer has to speak to their bank. And finally, when affecting the actual charge, the bank can decline simply because the customer has no funds or there's some risk checks that fail. And I'll come back to those risk checks because that's, that's an important thing. Um, yeah, so that's whistle stop technical uh, background. Is any, are there any questions there before I move on? Um, hopefully I've conveyed, conveyed things okay. No questions. Um, oh, there's I a chat. Hi, my name's Ken. Uh, just hey, Ken. Do you, the metrics that you had there with the desktop sales versus the, the mobile sales, it had like, it, so it said like the RAND value was greater on the desktop sales. Do you guys have any sort of metrics about, you know, like whether that's because, you know, there are more, like the more expensive products are bought on desktop because the people are doing more research or some crap like that? Or, uh, or like, is the cart quantity greater? Like, are there more pro items on a ca cart on checkout? Like, what do we like? What do we think is going on there? That's a really good question, and to be honest, I, I don't have the answer to that. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's something worth investigating. But what I what I would believe is that um, high value purchases that you pay for online, and we we've had some very high value purchases going through online. Um, uh, are typically, it feels more secure to do it on a desktop than a mobile phone. For whatever that's worth, it may not be true, um, but that could be the case. Um, but it's, yeah. it's certain that there are fewer purchases on desktop, but they are of higher value. Yeah, and you don't have any metrics about like that value being just higher value items or if it's just like larger cart sizes. So I'd be interested to know, like, you know, is it like maybe it's just, not user friendly to have large carts on a, on mobile because of some sort of UI UX. But my like gut feel would be maybe like if you buy an expensive item, you might be like sitting at your desktop and having multiple tabs open and doing lots of research on who's got like the cheaper product and that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. You know? Yeah, I, it's it's a good point. In some in some respects, our knowledge of that is limited because sometimes as a payment gateway, we only receive the amounts. For the purchase in, okay. in other instances we could actually do that research um and it, it's something worth looking at um my yeah i'm not even gonna hazard my gut feel here but it's it is an interesting point it'd be cool to gather those metrics i mean get the line items at least like from from you know like the plugins or whatever whoever's building like the the, the like group commerce plugin for example you know it'd be cool to receive those line items so we could at least gather those metrics you know not just the value amounts, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, in some respects, we can do that research internally, uh, and and I'm going to look into that to satisfy my, my curiosity. And uh, 
whatever I find, I'll share back with you. Will you mail me, please? Yeah. Well, I, I might just share it with the community. So everyone, everyone <laughs> knows. But, uh, yeah, okay. certainly include you in that. Okay, cool. And then with the three secure fails, um, what, uh, like, what sort of feedback, I mean, do you guys give to, the, first of all, I guess, to like the developer or the merchant, like, who's so that we can pass that response on to the customer because it feels like like that type of failure is um is sometimes like not communicated to the customer and it's and and then like the the, the transaction just ends you know yeah you're absolutely not right i mean good feedback to the customer means the merchant gets fewer queries and then ultimately we get fewer queries because the merchant is our customer, right? So it's essential to give good feedback to the, to the customer. And we are getting better and better at that ourselves. Uh, and we do indicate when it's uh, um, a decline because of like a 3D secure error. Um, but certainly there's always room for improvement. That'll be in the response, obviously, from whatever the API calls yeah. whatever. So it'll be a response from our service back to the plugin and the plugin will give the error response back to the customer and the merchant. So we can add an order notes onto the orders when they failed, giving an, um, some idea of what failed, but also to the customer in the display. Okay, okay cool. Yeah. Uh, and then one other question, sorry. Like with Google Pay and, and like Apple Pay, that's actually like tied to your credit card payment anyway, right? Because your credit card is what Google Pay is using. And so they are essentially counted in the metrics of credit card payments, not in the metrics of, of the wallet payments, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. The technicalities, though, is that uh, those platforms uh, provide a token back to the payment processor, uh, right? And the payment processor processes against that token. Most times it's going to be against the credit card. But there's no guarantee that's going to be the case in the future, right? It could be from any number of things. Um, sure, but so, the, so the metrics that, that, that you showed us there, do you, do you believe that those metrics for credit cards and debit cards include the Google Pay credit card? No, 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 they don't. Um, okay. they, but they do clump the mobile wallets all together and they're, they're various forms of mobile wallets, not necessarily just Apple Pay. Um, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. That's it for now. Thank you. Cool, cool. Thanks, Kent. Okay, so um, again, this is an idea of what we think payment gateways should aim for, not saying that we're perfect. I think there's always room for improvement, uh, but these are some of the things that we think are, are important, um, and I'm just gonna dig into them now. Um, so goal number one, <laughs> keep it simple. Um, running a business is really hard. Running an online business has a lot of other complexities, and it's even harder. So uh, with all of the barriers and the complexities, um, you know, small businesses are really uh, an underdog here. You know, they don't have the resources that big business would have, and you, they just can't afford the complexity. So you shouldn't have to really fight hard just to take payments online. So a key part is keep it simple. Don't complicate small businesses' lives with extra complexity. Um, so accepting payments should ideally be for the, for the merchant and for the customer, Number one, obviously reliable, so that means available, so your ser the servers don't go down, as error-free as possible and scalable. So one of the big things is there's going to be a spike on Black Friday, right, or in other periods of the year. There's no point making sales in the quiet periods, but when it comes time to have a busy period, then everything falls over. So it's got to be reliable in terms of scale as well. It must be secure, goes without saying, PCI compliant. Fraud detection I put here. It's very important that payment gateways detect fraud, um, maybe not on your site, but on other sites, because if we can successfully block, block fraudulent attempts, that means that legitimate transactions, particularly from overseas, have less chance of being blocked due to automated risk checks, because we will have a good profile with the banks. Um, so fraud detection is essential, and that's something we, we work very hard on. Um, got to protect the merchant from abuse and we've got to protect the customer from losing their funds. Um, 3D secure and chargebacks and reversals come into play there. That's also pretty much a given. It's got to look professional. Uh, it's got to be fast to load, slick to use. It's got to look legitimate. 
And the reason quite simply there is that if a customer tries to pay and your payment experience is dodgy, they won't have confidence. <laughs> it's as simple as that, and they won't convert. So merchants, when they choose a payment gateway, want to give their customers the best chance of completing the payment. Um, Burden-free, you know, don't, don't make the merchant do more work than is required. Avoid distractions. This is a big one, and I think this is going to be a massive trend going forward. Uh, merchants uh, are going to want to in do integration. We already see this all the time. We get many, many requests for integrating products from different platforms, stock counts, reconciliation and reporting. I think this is really huge. I know there are tools out there already um, and that provide this. I just think this is going to get bigger and bigger. And then lastly, uh, consolidated. So if you have a brick and mortar store and you have an online store, I think payment gateways and payment providers have to work really hard. So the experience is the same or similar to the merchants and the customers, and that we make use of the synergy between those two opportunities. You could order online, collect in store. Um, you may have an online invoice which you pay in store or you go in store and you end up doing an online transaction for whatever reason you get a payment link so there's a lot of crossover there a lot of opportunity um, and you need we need to make that simple for merchants um, goal number two and this seems like a kind of an obvious one <laughs> but the only reason for us being there is to enable the exchange of goods uh, for money right so we we need to enable that interaction we should never get in the way of it in whatever we do. Um, so, because what's good for the customer and the merchant is ultimately good for the payment gateway. Um, so what does that mean in practice? We have to make work very hard to make sure the path to doing a sale is smooth and easy and it just works. Um, and I want to point out here the difference between conversion rates, which is what merchants care about overall, what percentage of people visiting your site putting something in their cart and trying to pay for it, actually end up paying for it. Um, and approval rates, which is part of the conversion, but when they enter their credit card details, they pretty much sold, right? They want to buy it. They've gone to that step. How many of those instances fail? And that's what I mean by approval rates, where they enter their card details, but it still, still doesn't work. Um, so payment gateways can play in both spaces. We can help conversion rates, by giving you two tools to encourage completion, instilling trust and confidence, reducing friction. Um, and again, 3D Secure 2 will help with reducing friction. Um, and we can also work on approval rates. So authentication failure like 3D Secure brings down approval rates. Issuer declines because of um, funds or many other reasons bring down approval rates. But gateway reliability, retrying transactions in the background efficiently, providing multiple payment routes in the event that one of the payment processes is down temporarily, all of these improve approval rates. And then lastly, uh, it's got to be profitable for the merchants. So lower prices play a big part. Why? Low fees translate to lower prices, which means you're going to get more customers buying your goods. Lower setup fees and lower maintenance costs mean you can allocate resources to giving your customers a great experience and converting sales. Um, goal number three, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but we really believe that anyone should be able to accept payments, uh, apart from maybe fraudsters and people trying to steal your money, which we're very careful to check about. But we're trying to lower the barriers for sign up uh, for the regulatory hurdles, which in many cases aren't necessary. Uh, um, the cost hurdles and barriers, complexity and expert knowledge that's required. Um, and why, why do we do this? Because small businesses, frankly, are critical for our economy. We really, really need them. And it's going to be a driving force for South Africa going forward. And historically, many have been excluded unfairly. Um, and there's just, frankly, for us, there's just so much enormous potential out there. Um, and it's going to be benefit Yoko and uh, the economy. Um, and then finally, uh, and this has been mentioned very often by our own merchants. We heard it today in an internal meeting that merchants want to get their revenue and they want it quickly. They don't want payment gateways to sit on their money for any length of time at all. Uh, they want their money when they make it and they want to react quickly. They want to buy new stock. They want to pay people. And actually any delay is an additional cost to the merchant. 
and it's an invisible cost um, and it can be quite painful. So those are the four goals um, that we strive for. Uh, what, what can you do as a merchant? Um, just doing a quick time check here. Uh, what can merchants do uh, to make things run smoothly and get sales? Um, well, firstly, you can plan ahead and choose wisely. So just setting up your sites. And in this case, in WordPress and Wo in WooCommerce, try to look for an easy path forward that's not going to give you hassles. Easy installations, um, themes, templates, which are going to be easy to modify, but still look great. Uh, WooCommerce blocks, uh, perhaps as a way of customizing your site in a quick way. Delegating maintenance of the site. You don't want to be doing security updates yourself necessarily. Um, you don't want to have to upgrade your site yourself. In some cases, you don't have the funds to pay for that, but as much as you can delegate away, the more you, time you can spend on running your business. For the payment gateway, do your research, speak to the community like this community, uh, try out a payment gateway by buying something on another site to make sure your customers are going to have a great experience. Is signing up simple? Is it simple to activate and test? Is it quick to start to transacting? How long do you have to wait before you can actually make a sale? How often are you going to get paid out? Um, what is the cadence? And is the gateway improving? What is it offering now? What is it going to offer in the future? Um, and then finally, if you're going to be, if you have a physical store and you have an online store, what's the experience like for you and for your customer? And is there a combination? Um, I know that there are various WooCommerce point of sale solutions. Shopify has a point of sale solution. We also obviously being uh, an in-person business before online, we have a point of sale system as well. Um, and then something that, that's really interesting, I know many plugins already cater for this, but um, if you're a smaller site and you have modest hosting and you struggle with many plugins, your site might not be as stable or as uh, robust. Uh, you might want to move the payment off-site off to a hosted checkout. In practice, we've seen that this can make a big difference. Um, and you also benefit from the brand awareness of the payment provider. Um, if you're a smaller site, you, you, for better or for worse, the customer might not trust you as much as they would a big, big payment provider. So many plugins do this already, off-site checkout. On the other hand, if you're a larger brand um, and you want to keep your customer on-site and offer them a great consistent experience, then complete on-site. Um, and then finally, if you want really low-level deep integrations, you might want to move away from plugins and go to some sort of low-level integration as you scale. So it's something to bear in mind. And it's something that us as payment gateways, we need to give you those options to choose. Um, making sales uh, goes without saying, you, you need to stay connected to your customers, uh, build a relationship, build up your brand. But most importantly, you really need to know your customer. And what we can do and what others can do um, you know, is to get analytics and information about your, your customers. What is their profile? What are, they, what are the trends? What sale, what's selling better? When is it selling better? Um, when are the issues? How rapidly can you respond to customer issues? Because that level of service makes a big difference. Um, communication, promotions, loyalty, and can the payment gateway help you with that? Can the payment gateway give you the information uh, that's gonna help you make the right choices? Um, so that's something for the payment gateways to work on. We, we're working on that, um, but also it's something for you to look out on. And then finally, make it easy to pay. Um, offer the most preferred, once you've got the insights, offer that payment method as an easy option right from the start, but also make it easy to select alternative methods. And very important, remove as much friction as possible. The more friction, the more delay a customer has to go through from the checkout in order and, until they pay, the less likely it is to be a completion. Um, and then understand why things go wrong. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I'm going to move on quite quickly, but check the fees and look at the fine print and see what you're actually going to come out with. Um, Felix Norton gave a great talk about this a little while ago. He sort of delved into the nitty gritty and things change as well. So stay up to date with fees. 
uh, and see how they change. Um, it's a very competitive landscape at the moment and uh, the gateways are really offering great pricing. So look, look out, see what's going on and make sure whatever your final margins are that they're sustainable, obviously. Um, if you are using something like WooCommerce, uh, I don't think that precludes you from using other methods. I think that they're great to use in combination. So go social, use payment links as well. There are invoicing solutions already as plugins. Um, you can also use other invoicing solutions. Get yourself in marketplaces like Bid or Buy or Take Lot. But the most important thing I can mention here is don't dilute your brand. Um, always bring the customer back to who you are and what you do. Um, and then finally, global markets. We, we've got merchants who are selling overseas very successfully. Uh, a couple of examples we do. A merchant has art sales in the US. And we have a yoga instructor who's giving classes in Singapore online. Um, and they're making that work very successfully. In South Africa, we're required to accept South African rands um, by the regulations. But that doesn't mean you can't present the customer with their currency and their tools for doing this. Uh, unfortunately, the currency that you present to them is only going to be um, approximate, an estimate. Um, and when they finally do the payment, there may be variations, which is, is, may result in chargebacks. When the customer sees the final bill amount on their bill, they may try to reverse it. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, there also is dynamic currency conversion where the customer will see the actual value that they're going to pay. And that's what they'll pay. Unfortunately for the merchant, that can be quite costly because you're paying extra fees. So do your homework there, um, but definitely don't limit yourself to South Africa. There are opportunities overseas. And in this day and age, there's nothing to stop us from selling overseas. If, if so much is remote first. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. So I want to want to finish up now with uh, just a, our, our big thinking at Yoko is how do we get better? We always want to get better. And, and we think looking at this type of community, um, community is key. Um, so one of the best things about WordPress and WooCommerce is the community. And we can't do everything ourselves. If we try to do it ourselves, we're not going to do as good a job as if we involve other people. So developers, developers, developers. Um, I couldn't resist putting Steve Barmer up there, sweaty Steve Barmer, uh, at that famous conference in 2000, um, chanting developers. It's a bit of a bit of a cliche, but it's, it's true. Uh, we need to build things together. When there's a community, we support each other. And when you have um, providers and gateways um, giving you the tools, there's innovation that we can't dream of. And we can do so much more to build amazing payments for merchants and customers if we do it together. And yeah, it's already happening. Um, many companies are API first, developer driven. Uh, we certainly want to be a part of that as well. And um, yeah, thank you. That is my talk. And happy to take more questions and give out some prizes. Yeah, I'll, I'll go again first. Um, thanks, yeah. Um, hey, Clint. I, I checked, so I've never actually integrated into uh, into the Yoko into into the Yoko payment gateway. Um, recently, I did some integration to Paystack, and and I've I've done I've done lots of integration before that. But the what? So Stripe recently bought Pay, Paystack. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. In, in the UK, like the Stripe payment gateway, um, the, the plugin for WooCommerce um, is true, like on site, you know, like you actually, there's no pop-up um, at all, you know, so it's like the form is in line. It is written a little bit crap. It still uses jQuery, so it's lots of like bloat and stuff like that, but whatever, um, that, that we can take that out for now. I'd really think that whoever devs these plugins should not rely on the WooCommerce or the um, the WordPress stack because, you know, it, it should be like native JavaScript just to like bring down performance, you know, on code load with libraries, you know, core web vitals and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's just my little rant. Um, but um, so I checked that you guys are actually listed as the developer of the plugin, whereas like the 
plugin that's that's kind of like now shipped with WooCommerce if you install it as a South African store for Paystack was written by, and I'm sure I'm going to murder this guy's name and my apologies um, if I do. Uh, what's his name? Ton Bosen. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and so I checked that like it used to be called, you know, you had two options, either redirect or inline. Um, but it was not true in line, it was actually a pop-up. And then later it was like renamed to pop-up as the label, but in the code, it's still like in line, you know? Um, so like my quick, like, so I'd, I'd really like to have proper in line. And then the question is kind of like, how much involvement do you guys have? Obviously, because, you know, you guys are listed as the developers. So are, is that in-house developers that are developing it? And from the screenshot that I can check, that's also not true in on site. It's like a pop up that is invoked, and it's not like you, you cannot like embed the form, um, which uh, which I don't like. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So 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 I can answer a couple of those questions. Yes, we write the code. In fact, I, I write some of the code, but we have other engineers on our team. We write it in house. Um, you're right. It is a pop up. Um, it is possible to do in line and. It is something that we would like to do. We'd like to offer the option. It's it's somewhat complicated by the flow in WooCommerce. Um, so you need to do it carefully. And it's not it's not simple to do, but it certainly is possible. Um, yeah, so the, the, there's a good reason why it's not there yet, but it's not a good, good enough reason not to offer it, if that answers your question. Um, for sure. Um, yeah, for sure. So, so what's like, uh like where in the pipeline do you see that sort of dev team done yeah look as i said earlier um one of the big priorities for us is to um make it easy to take payments and give you flexibility so it is something that we're looking at but we're also working on a whole lot of other things um so i can't give you a, a timeline for it um in terms of priority, it does fall behind some other developments that we're making, um, but it is something that we're aware of and we want to get to. Um, I'm sorry, Clint, I, I know that doesn't help you, um, but, yeah. but but keep keep looking out. It will uh, undoubtedly be there. And uh, and I'm assuming that there's some sort of like, I mean, you did mention that there was like an SDK, so if I wanted to, I could just build my own in reality. Well, that was what my last slide is all about. The, the code is all there for the plugin. Right, and if you're a developer, I'd love to work with you. We really would. The SDK does inline forms, and it does pop-up forms, and it offers var variations. Um, so the technology is there, um, and we would definitely support any developer who wants to extend it. And we will accept uh, merge requests and pull requests, and we'll review them. So absolutely. Okay, cool. Where, uh, where, where is the repository? Put buckets. Get out with it. Uh, developer.yoko.com is the website for developers. Uh, we have a Yoko open um, GitHub account. The plugin is not there currently, but we do hope to take it there. Um, apart from that, you know, you could also just get the code directly from the plugins. It's, it's all there. But, uh, yeah, but obviously, that's not sustainable for doing merge requests and pull requests, whatever. So, yeah, if I um, to do a pull request, then obviously. Yeah, so we, we will put the Yoko. Uh, WooCommerce plugin on our GitHub repository um, and happily accept merge requests. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you say like you have like a five minute sign up process. So, how do you cater for first since there's not much required to sign in to sign up for? Sorry, can you just repeat the five minute sign up process? Yeah, I was saying like, since you know it's a simple sign up process, how do you cater for like fraudsters who may want to use uh, the platform? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so you can sign up very rapidly. Um, you can in fact start transacting uh, within minutes because we provide you API keys. We do have a KYC process where I, uh, before you can be settled and actually receive your funds, we do account holder verification and ID checks. So while you can 
go live on your website very rapidly, we do have to do our due diligence and make certain that we verify things uh, beforehand, um, before actually settling you. We settle within 48 hours. Um, so there is that buffer period. If you don't complete the KYC process, then obviously you don't get paid out, um, but your funds will be collecting. The other thing that we do is we um, proactively check the merchant's details against various watch lists in the background, um, and we do automated checks. And then we have a very good risk team who is monitoring patterns of transactions, um, and they will highlight any transactions which seem to be fraudulent. Um, yeah, so a quick sign up doesn't preclude us checking very carefully for fraudsters. We do that very actively. Okay, cool, thanks. I've got another question. Um, what would be like cool is if, so obviously like if, you know, the, the when you sign up, the, um, the like merchant account gets put into like a test mode and, and then you, you pull the like test API key and secret or whatever you need. Um, what, what would be cool? Cause it's so like, obviously like I've, oh, I did some uh, like investigation to like test a whole bunch of different payment gateways based on the, obviously like how, what the costs are, but then also like what code is out there. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I went and looked at a whole bunch of plugins and whatnot. Um, and, and what that means then is that like, I got to go and create accounts for every single one of these. And it would be cool if, for, if there was just like a, like sort of public blanket test account that ships with it, you know? So that like, all I do is I install the plugin, it's got a test secret and a test key that is like the, the like, the like public test secret test key. I don't need to do any sign up and I can just go and test the payment gateway, test the flow, and I don't need to do any sign up whatsoever. Yeah, well, you, you're in luck, Clint, because we do provide keys that are global test keys and you can find them in our developer docs and you can use them for testing. You don't have to sign up. Um, put those keys in the code. And, they, and if you look at our Yoko PHP, if you look at our PHP library that we published on Yoko Open, you'll find the test keys there. So you can, you can pull that sample project, uh, run it very quickly, the test keys in there. Um, and yes, absolutely. When we do publish the plugin um, on GitHub, when we put it up there, the test keys will be available in by default. Okay. The global test keys. That's cool. Thanks. How's it, Dennis? Hi. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, it's me again. I'd just like to know. I know that PayFast offers like gateways for. MTN, Momo, and and in the normal debit cards and all that. I just want to know when will Yoko offer that as well, and as well as Kazang and Ozo. Yeah, so um, we want to provide as many methods as possible, but we also want to prioritize what we think is going to make the biggest difference and which is most widely used. Um, uh, so we, we need to see what is going to have the biggest impact for the most of our merchants. We'll be quite selective about that, but it is a big priority for us to add multiple methods. Um, Ozar, you mentioned um, instant EFT in general is something that we are looking at quite closely. Um, so I, all I can say is watch, watch the space. Um, we, we certainly do think that there needs to be alternative methods offered as part of our checkout. Because uh, what I've noticed was that a lot of people are not comfortable with buying things online because I don't know, they get, they get a sense of someone can just steal the information, but something like Kazam, where you just put in a voucher number, you buy the voucher number and then you just put it in there. Then you don't have to worry about your banking information being online and being stolen. So I think that's, what you guys need to add. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks for the, thanks for the feedback. Um, I'm, I'm going to take it back to the team. Uh, can you tell me is um, stock management, is it working right now? Um, if a merchant sells something um, with, and the connection with WooCommerce, does the stock, um, 
Does it adjust the stock levels? Are you aware if that's currently working? So we, we do have stock management um, in our point of sale system and in our business portal for merchants. Uh, that's for um, in-person sales. So we, we don't have a link to the WooCommerce plugin. So when you, you can sync your stock levels to WooCommerce, and when you sell on WooCommerce, that you can decrease the stock back on the Yoko um, stock management system. So we don't have that integration, but I, I do think it's important to offer that type of integration. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Sure, no problem.